So um, I am very glad today to welcome Nancy, and I'll butcher your last name, is it Yeasley? Yeasley. Yeasley, okay. Um, Nancy comes here today from the Nansif, Nassif Community Cancer Center um, with Unity Point. We are so glad that she's here. Um, she will be talking about self-care and mindful caregiving. Um, so I will turn it over to Nancy today. All right. Thanks, Abby. And, you know, thank you for people joining the meeting today. As caregivers, um, you know, Abby and I, we, we get it that it's your time is of essence and being able to make self-care a priority is, is makes sense, but to actually do it and take time for something like this today, um, kudos to you for, for doing that. Um, you know, part of certainly what we'll talk about today is how that makes you a better caregiver. And, you know, it can seem, gosh, I'm taking time for myself, um, but really you're, this is helping you be a better caregiver for your loved one. Um, so it's a win-win. And I wanna share that um, I'm a pretty casual presenter. What I would love is as we're talking, get notice I said we, um, as we're talking, join in, you know, don't, don't worry about interrupting. I know on Zoom, timing can be a little odd and you can, you try to find the right time. Don't worry about that. If you've got an experience to share, um, something to add, something that will enrich in the conversation for everybody, because I think learning from each other as caregivers um, with the Caregiver Center, a big thing is just that community of other caregivers and being together and sharing your experiences and not feeling alone is so huge, so beneficial. So jump in anytime. Don't worry about timing or interrupting, just jump on in. And if I don't notice anything like your hand going up or you starting, that's on me, not on you. So we will start the slideshow. I think <laughs> technology and I are not always, here we go. What we're gonna do today. First off, um, just acknowledging the challenges of caregiving. This is hard work. What, what you're doing um, is not an easy task and just noticing and acknowledging that versus, oh yeah, you know, it's what anybody would do or oh, it's what everybody does or it's no big deal, is it? necessarily accurate. So acknowledge that this is hard work. Therefore, um, it's important to take time for things like today. The second objective is just to develop an understanding of what it means to be a mindful caregiver. Yeah, we'll talk, what is that mindful caregiver? Um, we'll throughout talk about the importance of self-care. Um, it's definitely a reoccurring theme. What we wanna do is also practice being present in the moment and being aware of your, yourself, your surroundings, your loved ones, being in, in tune is another way to put that. Um, and then just increasing the acceptance of whatever your thoughts and feelings are. You know, that whole, you shouldn't should on yourself. <laughs> yeah, you know, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't act this way. You know, we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about that and how to instead work on accepting those thoughts and feelings for what they are. Right. We'll start with those caregiver challenges. Um, caregiver challenges, this list could be very, very, very long and probably endless, um, but Mastering new skills, um, the things you, know, you have to do, whether you wanna think about the medical issues in terms of a crash course in nursing, um, whether it's taking on roles in your relationship that you haven't before, financial um, decision-making, home repairs, you name it. Um, another challenge, developing new ways to relate to your care recipient, to your loved one. Your dynamic in your relationship is is shifted and how to find ways to uh, reconnect. That's the 
challenge throughout any relationship from um, when you first meet throughout a lifetime, trying to adapt and relate to each other through those changes and those relationship dynamics. Making tough decisions or just making countless decisions. I mean, from little ones to big ones, um, the amount of decisions as a caregiver that come to you on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, but those tough decisions, maybe if you're caring for your partner, for your spouse, you used to make these decisions together and now not having that sounding board in that same way and having more of it come on you. Maybe it's not all on you, but maybe your loved one can't participate in those decisions in the same degree as they used to, um, or just maybe it really is all on you. Navigating through the complex medical system. Wow, yeah, healthcare can get pretty tricky. Just the idea that from a billing standpoint, you get this thing called an EOB, you know, first of all, you know, we use all these abbreviations, you know, um, that election of benefits statement, but that's not really the bill. And the bill that come might not really match the EOB. And maybe um, you get billed wrong or the de delay in bill. I mean, just navigating through the financial part, much less making appointments, um, pharmacy things, refills, all those challenges. Um, and how about the challenge of taking care of yourself? You know, we have, you know, um, several women joining as caregivers today and, um, you know, just thinking about throughout your lifetime as um, wives, mothers, daughters, sisters, you, your roles and your families often have been taking care of other people. And the same would be true with, with men caregivers. I was just speaking to seeing the women we were, we had joining us today. The facts about feelings. Oh, aren't those two different things, facts and feelings? But we're going to talk about the facts about feelings. Um, and please chime in if you're like, oh, this resonates with me. I see some heads nodding and some things like, you know, but yes, make sure you join. Most caregivers experience difficult emotions throughout their caregiving experience. Well, that seems like a no-brainer. But remember, one of our objectives today is acknowledging those and in in acknowledging them as difficult and challenging. Um, your feelings are a natural response to what is happening in your life. Again, that's gonna speak to one of those objectives of acknowledging and not shoulding, that you shouldn't feel that way, just acknowledging. Who wouldn't feel frustrated, worried, scared, exhausted? Um, and so forth. Um, and then the other fact is feelings are messages. They're just not in written form, but they're messages telling us to, you know, stop, look, listen, and pay attention, pay attention to what's going on. You're feeling this way for a reason. So instead of trying to say, I don't want to feel this way, or I shouldn't feel this way, uh, acknowledging that there's a reason behind it. Feelings, instead of thinking to, you know, feelings, as I said, what's behind it can prompt questions. You know, what's going on? Why am I feeling this way? What can I do about these feelings instead of ignoring them or telling them they shouldn't be there? Um, and more importantly, too, what will help? What will help make them even just a lessened a little? Like, less intense. It doesn't have to be make them go away, but even when you're feeling anxious, anything that can make that anxiety go down a little bit, it's moving in the right direction. So what we're talking about is making adjustments to those feelings, not pushing them aside. So um, it is not our feelings, but how we respond to them that make a difference in how they affect our lives. So yeah, the problem isn't the, isn't the frustration. If it's a problem, it's how you react to the frustration. Um, if we keep trying to survive instead of finding a better way, 
you can't stay in that survival mode, just that push through kind of mode um, for long. I equate that to, you know, living in Iowa, doing some winter driving. I equate that, that idea of surviving versus finding a better way to me. Surviving equates to like in the winter on a bad road when you're driving, white knuckling it, when you're like just holding on and you're or through fog, you know, when you're just like, oh, I got to get through this. Well, you can do this, but you couldn't do that in a drive across the whole country. Um, that wouldn't work out. So the idea is finding a better way to deal with it instead of just tightening your grip and waiting to get through it. So in other words, finding other ways in terms of exploring alternatives to find better ways. Allow yourself to rebuild your life as it is instead of trying to just get through. So what is mindfulness? You know, mindful caregiving, mindfulness, what does that mean? Um, simply put, it's being aware and having a balanced acceptance of the present experience right now, it's the ultimate it is what it is statement. It is what it is. Um, but having that awareness and trying to find balance, notice that doesn't mean you're gonna do everything just right all the time, but there's a balance. Thinking about scales, good old fashioned scales, you're weighing yourself on up and down, um, finding that right balance. Um, means opening yourself to or receiving the present moment whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, just as it is, and without clinging to it or rejecting it. Um, and really without clinging to it, meaning thinking about, I want things to be how they are, and this is a good day, and I want every day to just be like this. How do I make every day be like this? Instead of enjoying that good day for what it is in just being in the moment of that day. You gotta like when things come step by step, right? Um, not that these are the only steps, uh, but these are some of the steps. Step one, self-reflection. Being a mindful caregiver requires paying attention to how caregiving impacts you, how it affects you. Does anybody want to share some self-reflection, how you see being a mindful caregiver? How does caregiving affect you? How does it impact you? Sometimes at the beginning of the stages, it seemed just like totally being overwhelmed. And I think it's very difficult to get past that first reaction. Feeling more in that crisis mode. Yeah. Like a big wave, like a big storm coming in, just hitting you all at once. Recognizing um, what's going on around you, recognizing those challenges of caregiving also includes recognizing what um, can be sometimes known as the spirit side of caregiving. So in other words, um, recognizing how your emotions affect your spirit, and back and forth. So, I mean, there's your feelings, there's your thoughts, how those things intersect back and forth and one, one impacts the other. And I can't think enough time after time how I keep thinking about and how when you throw in fatigue, when you're, when you're tired, when you're not getting your sleep, how that affects all of this more, more and more in terms of being aware of how you're feeling, being aware of your surroundings, being mindful. I mean, everything you do is, is affected um, in that way. 
So what is spirit? Your spirit, if, um, wherever your religious beliefs um, fall, thinking of, you know, the spirit is, you know, really the essence of a person, that, that inner part of, of who you are, um, that energy inside of you, um, what helps you stay connected? Um, I love the word connectedness. I think that's just at the essence of our relationships of feeling good about who we are, about the world around us, is feeling like we have some connectedness. And whether that's to the person we're taking care of, um, I think about how this last year and this pandemic has affected everybody's um, ability to stay connected with each other in, in some you know, pretty dramatic ways. But that spirit, protecting your spirit, taking care of your spirit is taking care of that essence of who you are. Um, feeling spirited is feeling, feeling uplifted and happy, but it's also feeling at ease, feeling just comfortable, again, feeling connected, feeling um, I, I really like the at ease the best because you could, everybody's going to think of feeling joyful and happy and excited and those things. But how about at ease, at peace? How about just feeling okay, relaxed, at peace? Those things, um, those things aren't as flashy, but boy, those things sure do feel good when you're feeling them. When you feel dispirited on the other end, um, feeling down or depressed, getting the fatigue, easily angered, impatient, uh, discouraged, happy, you know, feeling less happy. Um, and I wanna especially give a little credence to the easily angered or having a short temper or easily being easily irked. <laughs> um, oftentimes in working with, with people, um, I see when people think of depression, they think of the sad and the unhappy, the distraught. Um, that kind of quick temper, easily frustrated, um, easily angered, that is often a, a sign of depression that gets overlooked. Um, but, but it can be very real. And again, when you throw in the fatigue, it's easy to have a short fuse. And sometimes those are the things in day-to-day -day caregiving, easily annoyed, um, maybe is even a better way to put it than easily angered, but um, this is a huge challenge to caregivers, huge. So we talked about what is mindfulness. Now let's ask the why. Why mindfulness? Um, integrating mindfulness into your caregiving experience in everybody's is different. Makes taking care of your spirit and your overall well-being a priority. So what it means is that you, like with anything, you have to work at it and practice at it and pay attention to it. Um, you don't just suddenly become good at something, um, but it takes, takes some time to keep talking yourself through it. And I say talking yourself through it because a lot of it is self-talk. Uh, so we Way at the beginning, I talked about it. How will this benefit? How does this make you a better caregiver? How does this help your loved one you're taking care of? Um, I think it's um, fair to say that the person you're taking care of does tune into your energy and reacts to your emotions. Um, it can be contagious in that way. And so when you're more at ease, um, more content, that they will be, you know, the people around you will be. It's, it's, it's that way, whether 
somebody is, you know, like I said, those more flashy emotions like happy and joyous, <laughs> um, but also with just being more at ease. Um, and if you are more tense or more easily frustrated, the same thing, it, it will put puts the other people around you um, on edge as well. So now the caution here is then how to not beat up on yourself or should yourself to not feel that way and make that be a negative thing, but how to just more again, acknowledge, acknowledge it for what it is um, when, if you're feeling that way. And then third of all, the benefit when you and the person you're caring for, when you're both more at ease, notice more at ease, it doesn't mean completely at ease, just again, more at ease. Um, your experience and relationship can take on new meaning and purpose. And, you know, the, the woman who here shared, you know, at the beginning when everything seems um, so, so hard and you're in more of that crisis mode, oh, it can seem pretty Pollyanna for somebody to say that you could ever find a new um, meaning and purpose in your relationship that might about make your eyes pop out of your head. But, Hopefully, if you work through that crisis point and find more of your groove in things um, with acknowledging some things and being accepting of what they are and how the situation is, you can find some of the benefits in caregiving, um, some of the good things. Um, I've always believed as, as a social worker in helping people through difficult things in that out of something, just very simply, but out of something bad can, can something good. Out of something hard, can you can find some benefit. Now those things don't always even out, um, but when you're looking for some good, um, you can find it, maybe not right away and maybe not as easily as you can, but over time, as you work through things, hopefully you can find um, find some positive things as well. How you work through these things and find your acknowledgement of your situation, of your feelings, of the way things are, um, is impacted by a lot of different factors. And it would be um, naive to think that these things don't make a difference. Um, how you became a caregiver, whether it was suddenly, you know, from um, a stroke, from a car accident, something that was a very sudden, you know, sudden event that your relationship was one way and there was a big event and now everything's changed instantly. Um, whether it is for um, at a time in your life when you would expect it more or oftentimes um, somebody who becomes a caregiver at a younger age feels less like this is supposed to be happening now, <laughs> um, taking the whole idea of the sandwich generation of people caring for a parent and having children at home and trying to balance being not just a caregiver, but a caregiver for multiple people who need multiple things from you kind of situation. Um, but also, and that speaks to here, you know, your current life situation, other responsibilities or stressors, whether it's you know, you're, you're trying to work and care for somebody, whether you have other people in your life, you know, the, the other people in your life, depending on you, um, other things going on. Um, also looking at your past and present relationships. Um, you know, maybe you're caring for somebody who you've had um, a long loving relationship with. Maybe you're caring for somebody who you've had at times a challenging relationship with for various reasons. Um, all that makes a difference as well. Your own health and the health of your loved one. Yeah, the degree of help we can often think about, well, what's the degree of help 
my loved one needs, especially when it comes to physical needs and moving somebody and lifting and, and those things. But what about your own health? I mean, giving credence to your own your own physical well-being makes a difference in how you can carry out your role as a caregiver. Um, financial resources, that's a very, uh, that's a very um, realistic um, factor that impacts things in terms of can you um, can you afford to hire in some extra help if and when you need it? Or is there just no way to do that no matter how much you come to the realization that it's what you need, the dollars to start there? Support system. That support system can vary in terms of other people to share some caregiving with, to give you some respite or to take their turn <laughs> and doing some things um, if you're sharing some caregiving, say with some siblings and so forth, um, but also your own support system in terms of a sounding board. I liked the picture of this with the journey of a caregiver. Um, well, I like analogies. So I liked this for a couple of reasons. One is this path isn't straight. It, it's winding. You can't see the beginning of it. You also don't know for sure where it's going. Um, one side of the picture is all pretty and in, you know, very crisp green colors. The other side is kind of blurry and unsure. And, um, I just think this really speaks to a lot about caregiving, both when I've when I've been a caregiver and when I've supported um, other people like you in your caregiving journey. Um, you know, the idea, you know, it isn't one size fits all. Um, you can't just say, here's the way to do this. Um, expect the unexpected along the path. Wow, if that isn't the truth, right? <laughs> expect the unexpected um, and how you have to make your own unique path. Um, what we hope to do with events like this today though, is have you know that you're not on that path alone. You're not on this journey alone. So uh, there isn't a picture of this one person walking down that path. Um, the path's wide enough for more than one. And whether, um, whether it feels like that every day or not, there are, there are people there to support you in different ways at different times. Ooh, I mentioned this a couple times here. We'll call it unrealistic expectations, that idea of you don't should on yourself. <laughs> um, we all have unrealistic expectations sometimes, um, and that's just part of being human. Um, unrealistic expectations are just things, beliefs you hold that just simply aren't feasible, not practical, or maybe not even achievable. Um, you may not even realize you hold these beliefs until you do some self-reflection, like we talked about before. You might not realize until you stop and acknowledge it and think about it, what you're like, oh, I guess I keep trying to push through and make it be this way because I expected it to be this way. And I think it should be this way. Um, sometimes you have a light bulb moment, as I call them, an aha moment where you're like, oh, yeah, that's just not going to happen, is it? So why do I keep bucking the system to try to make it be that way? Maybe I need to stop beating my head against that wall or countless other ways you could say that. <laughs> um, but the challenge there, be realistic. Um, don't should on yourself. I often, um, in working with people with um, cancer, as I do, and their families, often talk about these very scales, um, being realistic. And that really stinks sometimes when the reality you're facing isn't what you want the reality to be. And you've got these hopes in these dreams and these plans and, but especially hope, like you've got hope for it to be one way and the reality happening is another in how to balance those things out um, and adjusting your hopes 
to be able to fit into the reality of the situation is emotionally some really, really hard work. The emotional impact of unrealistic expectations. Um, that roller coaster kind of says it all. <laughs> that that looks like um, like the big daddy of them all kind of roller coaster to me. And in that, um, you know, and you often hear talk about, you know, something can be an emotional roller coaster. Caregiving can be an emotional roller coaster. Um, but um, as the woman shared before, you know, when you're feeling so overwhelmed, like could we put all those letters in that word in big capital letters, um, big bold capital letters, um, caregiving tasks can seem so overwhelming that you don't feel what you're experiencing. You're just so overwhelmed that everything else, um, all your other feelings are pushed to the side. And I think on that roller coaster, I would feel that way, yes. Um, caregivers, some challenges that you feel, some things you may feel that are harder to figure out and acknowledge, um, role confusion. That seems, and that kind of rolls together with role changes. Parent-child relationships is the easiest um, example you know, to come up with there definitely. You've been you've been the, the child, you've taken direction from somebody in your life, you've valued their opinion. When you've had a challenging time, you've gone to them. Now you're needing to help them through things, through the help them through decision making. Um, I know I've been experiencing that with my mom the idea of decisions that she used to be able to make on her own or before my dad died they'd make together and now i'm we're having to find a new way of me helping give her direction in a way that is acceptable to her and and it's it's hard it's hard those are changes in our role um definitely this can also happen though you know, with spouses within any relationship between, you know, spouses, there's different roles people play, whether you're talking about how you divide up the tasks and the chores, or in terms of emotionally in your relationship, who's, who's more nurturing, who's more, you know, steadfast, different ways, you know, of showing your love for each other and those things have become blurred and um, you're needing different things from different people and maybe the person you're needing something from isn't able to give you what you need and what you want in the same way that they used to in, in that. Um, and that can be hard to pinpoint and describe and in that, but that's where you get into the idea of ambiguous loss. It's ambiguous for that reason. It's hard, it's a sense of loss, of sadness, of something, of some grief without being able to definitely put your finger on it sometimes. Um, talking more about role confusion. I feel like I'm parenting my parent. Um, I sometimes feel less like a wife and more like a nurse. I hear that a lot from, from spouses. I just, you know, I don't feel I'm like, it's like we're patient and caregiver or patient and nurse instead of husband and wife in that, and that that's hard. So I love my mother, but her disease has changed our relationship so much. Um, that loss, we see that a lot, um, obviously with dementia, um, that change of that, that person in front of you. When you talk about that person's spirit, that essence of that person, dementia masks that. Um, and that's definitely a loss that dementia takes away. Um, here's one, I miss the father I knew before this. You know, um, I miss the person I've known all these years because this has changed them, especially when it's changed their essence. Sometimes I don't know 
if I am a we or if I am an I anymore. Like everything you do and think about decisions throughout the day is for us and for we instead of for I or for me. How does it affect, you know, and it's just like, it can feel like a lot on your shoulders and make you have to think about things different ways. Um, role changes, the changing, and I, and I, and I use changing because it's an action word. This definitely takes something to be described as an action word, um, is shifting, adjusting, or evolving over time. And yeah, it's natural for relationships to do this over time, absolutely, but they can now be changing more suddenly and drastically. And you might be having to do more of the figuring out how to make that work on your own versus there being more of a give and take in your relationships. Um, the role changes, role changes requires you learn new ways to communicate and relate to one another, um, whether you want to do so or not, and how to make your way through the day and make your way through caregiving. Um, can feel like it takes a lot of negotiating, compromising, figuring things out, and maybe what works one day doesn't work the next and makes it even more challenging. Um, but just as a reminder, mindful caregiving requires an awareness of how your emotions impact your spirit and vice versa. It doesn't require that you do everything just right every time. Now the challenge of describing an ambiguous loss, if it's ambiguous, we don't know how to describe it, right? Um, but it's just that loss that's unclear, um, just doesn't have a clear re resolution or closure. You can't just put it in a neat little box. Um, can't be described or labeled into one word, um, not specific or concrete. And I think when you look at changes in your relationship changes in your life as a caregiver, um, especially the more and more you take on as a caregiver in your caregiver role. Acknowledging those changes can be an important part of moving forward. Ways to cope with ambiguous loss. Um, realize that it can feel like you're living in two different worlds especially, you know, the world of you as a caregiver and then your other world, if you're somebody who's going, you know, going to work, going, you know, taking, you know, have other family members you're doing things for. It can feel like you're going back and forth um, in two different worlds. Acknowledging. Acknowledge that your roles have changed. Um, instead of trying to cling to what they were trying to acknowledge that they have they have indeed changed. Honor all your feelings. Honoring all your feelings, um, and that can be a hard one for people. Um, finding a place where it's safe to share even your uncomfortable feelings. For some people, that's journaling. For some people, it's in prayer. Um, for some people, it's with, you know, a good friend or another family member, um, you know, talking with them. But you know, finding finding some place where you're able to be forthright about even your uncomfortable feelings. Mindfulness to adjust thoughts and actions. Much of how we behave starts with the way we think about things. Um, and again, sometimes don't even realize how we're thinking about them. And we call some of these um, entrenched beliefs, like they're really, we don't even, they're automatic. They're just really entrenched in us. It isn't like we're thinking it through, um, but maybe some of the decisions you're making, um, turning down help, um, for instance, from, from other family members or, or that, 
it can be, no one can really take care of my loved one as well as I can um, kind of thoughts. Or, you know what, he really just likes it best when I'm here with him um, more than when other people are taking care of him. Um, or a sense of, I know something bad will happen if I let someone else help out, um, which can be tied to the idea they might, a different caregiver who comes in might do things differently. Um, it could be that one time when you did leave, your loved one fell and now every time you think about leaving, you're thinking that's gonna, that's gonna happen if I let somebody else do this. Um, or there is no one who can really help me I'm, and I'm alone. And I know some people's situations are, are much more um, alone than others in that, but trying to find a way for um, the, someone to help if there is someone available who could. If stress burned calories, I'd be a supermodel. I like that one. I think I could. I think I could be a supermodel if that was the case, right? Because caregivers, caregivers could definitely be a, a whole lot of supermodels out there amongst caregivers. Um, but yeah, caregivers can learn to be more compassionate oh, with themselves. Caregivers are known for being compassionate, but how about with yourself? Um, be more compassionate with yourself by recognizing that holding on to those entrenched beliefs that nobody else can do it as well or whatever might be the case um, can cause great stress and discomfort. Well, who the heck wants to do something that causes great stress and discomfort, right? Nobody wants to do that. So how do, how do you though let go of some of those? Well, one way I have found um, to work for me is the idea of changing some of your thinking. Um, those automatic thoughts, those that self-talk that I was referring to, um, some of that self-talk or those entrenched beliefs can be, I have to make the right decision. What's the right decision? I need to do the right thing. What's the right thing to do here? Um, but if you just change one word, substitute the word best for the word right. I need to make the best decision oh, that's a little bit more freeing than the right decision. Um, when you use the word best, it frees you from not getting stuck in, it has to be right, it has to be right. Um, it also gives you the chance to look at other options because when you talk about the best possible thing to do, you're right there entertaining the ideas that there's other options versus there's this one and only way. Um, in that so so best allows you to examine all your options and to choose what appears to be the optimum for all involved it allows for a margin of error instead of the pressure to pick the one right way to do something so compassionate self-care means means and includes being mindful of what you say to yourself that that self-talk and so we're going to walk through a couple examples um, my situation is impossible and will never get better versus my situation can change and I, and I have to become open to whatever comes my way. So it's kind of like you should never say never and never say never and always. Um, you know, my situation's impossible and will never get better is that, you know, versus the idea of my situation can change or substitute, you know, my situation may change, my situation will change, my situation can change, um, and I have to become open to whatever comes. So just that openness, that openness to be what it is, um, can help you be open to what might be in the future, whether that future is tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year. So another example, someday, oh yeah, 
self-care, we can all acknowledge it's a good idea, but I don't have time. <laughs> um, someday I will take better care of myself, but I just don't have the time now. How am I supposed to do that? I do not have enough time in the day to do what I'm supposed to do. Um, versus saying, I will make the time to take care for myself, to care for myself, which will make me a kinder, more patient caregiver. In taking the time to care for yourself um, can be making, can be for five minutes, you know, five minutes of being able to sit in the recliner with your feet up and your eyes closed. Five minutes to stay in that shower a little bit longer to just actually let the water run off of you, take some deep soothing breaths, um, it doesn't have to be finding an hour or a day for self-care. You would start small, start with small increments. It's a lot more doable. I can't let anyone else care for my loved one because, and you could end that sentence many ways, versus saying, letting others take care of my loved one not only gives me some respite, but also adds new people and meaning to my loved one's life. Um, seeing how it could help them to be with somebody else for a little bit too. Here, an act of self-love. Um, mindful caregivers recognize that they matter too and are dedicated to making sure they take care of themselves in order to keep taking care of their loved one. Compassionate self-care messages. So we talked, we gave examples of um, things that put pressure on us, our self-talk. Here's some, some examples of some compassionate self-care messages to not just be compassionate to other people, but compassionate to yourself. I will do my best. Even if I, I don't do everything right or I don't get everything done, I, I will just do my best. Um, give it my best effort, make the best decisions I can in the moment and do the best job I can in the circumstances. I will take time for me because I matter too. I can accept help from other people. It is possible. I can do it <laughs> um, versus finding the reasons not to do it. I will learn to be okay with the unknown. Oh, that's a hard one. That is a hard one. Um, you know, in some people, I had an unusual day at work um, last week. In the same day, I met two different people that they were newly diagnosed with cancer, first day consult with the oncologist, two different people who said something along the lines of the serenity prayer of, oh, I don't worry about what I can't control. That's just not how I'm wired. Or yeah, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna jump ahead and worry about that because that might not even happen. I just, that's just not how I do. I just, I just take it for what it is now. I met two people who were brains were wired that way, like within a couple hours of each other. I was like, oh, we could all learn a lot from that, couldn't we? Um, just like people like that seem rare and to meet two in the same day is that was pretty amazing. So I just, yeah, I'm easily, easily amazed sometimes, maybe you're thinking, but yeah, I was like, wow, that's great. <laughs> um, Another self-care message, um, I'll stay open to change and expect the unexpected. Um, I think sometimes in, I know in my life, when it seems like one thing after another has happened and you're thinking, you, you gotta get through this and it'll get better. And then I gotta get through this and it'll get better. And at some point realizing that's part of, how it is that there's going to be another something um, to keep expecting something will happen, not in a doom and gloom kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop kind of thing, but in a, instead of it taking me by surprise and overwhelming me that an other thing has happened, how to 
um, help my mindset in a way of things happen. We'll figure it out. Things happen. Okay. Maybe at first I'm feeling overwhelmed, but okay, we got to find our groove, find a way to adjust um, and have it less be crisis after crisis. Um, then I just get to, yeah. A lot of what I shared today came from the Mindful Caregiver um, book, which is a really good, really good book that walks through a lot of this. Um, but the happiness trap, that, that talks a lot about that whole idea of not shooting on yourself. You could apply it to so many things beyond caregiving um, or wanting, you're waiting for like this perfect situation to come. So those were some of the resources that I used for this presentation. Thank you so much, Nancy. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Um, I'm so glad you were referencing the Mindful Caregiver. We do a book study here on the Mindful Caregiver book. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah. wonderful. And I know a few people actually in, in this group um, are attending that or have attended it. So I think it's a really helpful um, resource and how she phrases things too regarding self-care is, is wonderful. So I'm just curious then like how many sessions do you is it like a certain number of sessions you do together on this book then? Um, yes, yeah, so we have two volunteers that lead it and it's anywhere from eight to 12 um, is about how many they do. So they cover usually a couple chapters at a time, um, but we do it once, generally once a year in the spring. So we're just ending now and then there's a support group that follows. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so thank you for referencing that. I also like the, um, should not, what you said um, from the happiness trap. I think that's a really good way to look at that too. Yeah, we all do it. <laughs> yep. We just got to catch ourselves and rephrase it. <laughs> exactly. Anyone else have any comments or things that you, you thought were helpful? And don't forget to mute yourselves. I know sometimes that's tricky to do. Or unmute yourself, sorry. Well, it is tricky because the button's not there until you like yeah. go and hover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciated Nancy in the beginning when you um, talked about how to be aware of how your emotions affect you. Yeah. And I can, I know. Um, I have a good friend that's kind of going through that caregiving of her spouse that is with cancer. And um, she repeatedly would talk about how she knows now that she needs to make lists and write things down because she kind of understands she's not going to remember things all that well yeah. all the time. And also that role of she wishes she could be just the wife, but has yeah. turned into the nursing nursing caregiving and um any suggestions on how to help support people when when they make those kind of comments i'm like ooh, how can i how can i acknowledge it yeah i think um first of all just the idea that it doesn't have to be one or the other yeah it um, right now i mean you've spent your life being the wife and now you're you're the caregiver but it doesn't mean that you're not also the caregiver like you it's not all or nothing how to there's parts i think of them like overlapping circles mm -hmm. i mean there's you, your life has been spent with the circle of your role as the wife and now there's this caregiver role mm -hmm. but how to blend them right um, yeah even though there's parts that really are just distinctly different, <laughs> um, but there is finding that blended part, finding and it, you know those parts that overlap maybe is the beginning of finding that new groove of how this is working for now. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's a great suggestion just to remember that it doesn't have to be one or the other. So yeah, yeah blending of that, thank you. All right, well, if no one else has any other questions or comments at this point, 
I think we will tell Nancy, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time and um, your wonderful presentation and PowerPoint here. Um, some really great information, so thank you. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for all the great things you do at the Family Caregiver Center. So it's a great resource for the community. We appreciate it. Well, I hope you all have a wonderful day. And um, if you have any questions later on, I have Nancy's email, so I'd be happy to forward them to her if um, that works for you, Nancy. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you.